Coming up on Need to Know, Rochester Mayor Lovely Warren is in the studio to talk about the year that was and her plans for the city in 2016. We have a lot to discuss that's just ahead. Also on the show, you'll meet our new American graduate champion. It's a group using the game of soccer as a bridge building sport for Rochester youth. Need to Know is coming up right now. Some days we will fly, some days we will run, some days we will walk, and yes, some days we will crawl. Those words were spoken by Rochester Mayor Lovely Warren during her State of the City address nearly a year ago. She vowed at that time that she would never allow the city of Rochester to stop moving forward. After a year of soaring and crawling in Rochester, I'm talking about everything from the so-called game-changing Photonics Institute to the recent alleged New Year's Eve terrorist plot spearheaded by a local resident. What can we expect in 2016? And how will we know if we are in fact moving forward and if our best days are ahead? Joining me now to reflect on the events of 2015 and discuss her plans for Rochester this new year is Mayor Lovely Warren. And welcome back to the show. Oh, thank you for having me. So given the fact that this is the very first show of 2016, it's January, I have to ask, do you believe in New Year's resolutions? Yes and no, because <laughs> I never keep them. <laughs> That's a difficult you, thing, keeping them. Yes, you know, you always say, I always say, oh yeah, so I'm going to lose weight this year. It, uh, it, it doesn't always work out that way, so um, you try, but right. um, it's just really about, you know, looking forward. Right. And in terms of, if, even if sometimes it's hard to keep them, but I know we set those goals right mm -hmm. from the beginning of the mm -hmm. new year. And that being said, what is your main resolution for Rochester as mayor for 2016? Well, I, I think that we have to continue focusing on what our agenda is, you know, making sure that our neighborhoods are safer and that our children are receiving the best quality education that we can provide for them, as well as jobs and economic development. And we will continue to focus on, on those three uh, priorities as we move into 2016. So looking back for just a moment, because I know when we, when we set those goals, we reflect and naturally you look over the last, pa you know, the past year. So when you look at 2015, what do you believe is the biggest achievement for your administration? I believe working um, with, across the aisles on every level of government, whether you're talking about what happened with the Photonics Institute, the anti-poverty initiative, um, really focusing on economic development and jobs for our, you know, for all, that we are a community that's not just focused on the highly skilled, highly technical jobs, but we're also looking at ways to make sure that every citizen in Rochester has an opportunity to participate in the economic recovery of our city. And at the same time, I have to ask you, which decision do you wish you could take back from 2015? Uh, decision that I, um, I don't think that there is any decision that I wish that I could take back. The, you know, when you look at and you're making decisions, it is really about um, the information that you have and making it an informed decision and you live whatever with the outcomes that come from that. Um, you want to have the best information and then you want to make the best decision possible and, um, and, and, and deal with whatever consequences come. Well, you said during last year's State of the City address that the time for studies and committees is over. You said we must get to work implementing the structural changes needed to create a stairway out of poverty. Mm -hmm. You cited your involvement in the Rochester Monroe Anti-Poverty Task Force as one effort as, as mayor to do just that uh, and to address systemic poverty. There's certainly no quick fix, but for a family living in poverty right now, it's January 2016 in the city of Rochester, mm -hmm. what can they or perhaps may they look forward to this year? in the next two years that would provide hope that the stairway out of poverty is possible. 
Well, I think that when you look at the anti-poverty initiative and you you realize that every level of government from the governor's office down to the mayor's office and the county exec, all of us um, are working together with in partnership with not-for-profits, in partnership with the community. That is a different approach to trying to deal with this issue of systemic poverty that has um, been going on in our community for many years. And so as a family, you know, I can't say that, oh, tomorrow you'll be out of poverty. But what I can say is that every level of government is looking at ways in which we can remove the institutional barriers. Well, what barriers are you talking about? So if you as a, as a parent are working as a home health aide and you earn 25 cents more, then the first thing that we do is take away your shelter rents. We take away your child care. We have to look at that because basically what we're saying is, yes, you've moved up a little bit, but now we're going to take the rug from up under you and take away all of the support that we have been providing you. And that's not, um, in, in, in our minds, that's putting you back into the situation that you're trying to crawl, crawl out of. Um, having the governor's office at the table to look at that issue in the county, because when you look at social services, they're the ones that in our community are in charge of social services. Um, it, that, that to me is a, is a roadblock that we're going to try to remove and address. Um, when it it comes down to um, individuals that are have been previously incarcerated. I know that the city of Rochester has been for the last two years working with a company called CEO and they are really looking at individuals that are returning into the community, giving them a job, making sure that they have um, not only the support but also that they, they are developing that work habit to go out and work every day and um, in, a, in a job so that they can you know not return to the life that they that caused them to to be incarcerated and so I think that across the board that's what families can look towards um, we just talked about the fact that not only are three-year-olds but four years four-year-olds are now being enrolled in high quality pre-k programs which I think is significant for our community because we believe that the best place for a child is to be actually in a high quality pre-k program so that's what families can look forward to in terms of I know I just talked with Leonard Brock before on the program Program, um, who leads the Rochester Monroe Anti-Poverty Task Force. In terms of, I know it's it's hard to put a time on it, but uh, when, when I guess, when can we expect momentum, right? And, and when can we expect to see that some of the things that you just mentioned are in fact, yes, we are, ta we are making those concrete steps as we speak. When, when can we expect to see something like that? Well, in the, in the very short near term, um, we have, uh, the city of Rochester has an innovation team that has done a lot of research, a dynamic group of people on um, poverty and what we should try to remove and do first. And start off in a, a small you know, neighborhood. You may not be able to impact everything across the board, but let's do a neighborhood-based strategy. Right now, we're working with the anti-poverty initiative hand in hand to figure out which neighborhood that should be and then we will move from there and I think that um, the ideas that will come from that by you know March April May and into um, the mid-year we will start to see some of those programs take off and uh, we're excited about it. Now, Rochester experienced a police reorganization in 2015, mm -hmm. uh, in part to engage community policing at its core. Um, and 2015 also happened to be a year, I, th I think a summer in particular, of uh, immense uh, extreme gun violence on the streets mm -hmm. of the city. Um, I know the police reorganization is one way to, to take this on. The new gun corps, as it's called, um, is another effort to curb gun violence. What, what else does it take, in, in your opinion, um, to address these things? And do you, do you think these things will, in fact, the two things that I mentioned, help reduce gun violence? Um, I think that it really takes the community working together. Our officers can only, you know, do so much uh, to curb gun violence. It also has to do with, you know, what our, our residents are feeling, dealing with um, issues of trauma, dealing with issues that people might feel that they cannot discuss um, whatever problems they may have. Um, you know, open air drug markets, um, things that um, are not necessarily something that government controls, but is more so how the community is able to work with government to impact this. 
education has a huge uh, role to play in this because a lot of people that if you um, look at the the people that are incarcerated from you know this summer many of them have dropped out of high school they feel like or may see that sense in within themselves that they don't have an alternative and so part of trying to deal with this education issue is to give people that are currently in school hope but we also have a program called Operation Transformation Rochester which uh, and it has a program called Fresh Start for those individuals that have dropped out of, uh, of high school that want to come back don't know how to come back uh, that will walk them through the process of you know you need to get your GED you may need um, some ID you may need a job but to really be there as a support network and show you that what you're going through other people have gone through before and if you put in the work we can help you get over the hump it's just something that you have to want to do we can put in place every program and every step possible but unless you have people that's willing to walk that walk or walk up that staircase then you know it you know it sort of defeats the purpose but we have a lot of people in our community and I'm very very encouraged by the number of people that want to do better and that we're helping on a daily basis when it comes to tying into that and and the educational efforts um, and kind of syncing with, with violence and addressing addressing violence, I, as, I guess in that process, um, how much are you using the or utilizing the thoughts, perspectives of, of city youth um, and addressing some of those things? They're at the table. Uh, um, we have the Mayor's Youth Advisory Council, YVOV. We also have um, part of uh, the, the program OTR is OTR Talks, where you have people from you know youth all the way up into uh, more seasoned and senior people talking to individuals that cross the spectrum. spectrum. Um, so we are really, really excited about the fact that you know every part of our community is being touched you know as it pertains to age. And I believe that our youth have a, a, a huge role to play in where this, the future of our city goes. You know, you have um, many different programs um, and community organizations that are working with our youth because we recognize and realize that they're not just the future, they're, they're our right now. And we have to give them the support and give them the love that they need so that they can be successful in life. We'll stay on education for just a moment because I know this is this is a, a, a major focus for you. We've got a clip that I want to show in just a moment. Uh, we talked to you two years ago uh, on the program and you expressed a number of educational efforts that, that you were planning to focus on right away in your term. So let's just take a look at that. We'll be working on um, instituting the Office of Education Innovation. That's the first thing that we're going to do, um, opening up the doors to um, charter schools with proven success rate in urban education is something that we're going to go after. Um, also, working with the school district and, and partnering, um, seeing which ways that we can utilize the resources that we currently have on the table a lot better um, is something that we are, are doing in also our recreation centers. You mentioned the Office of Education Innovation. So talk to me a little bit about, about that effort and the role that it's playing and, and providing you know, educational opportunities for kids. So we, we started the, um, the uh, Alan Williams is the person in charge of the Office of um, Strategic Initiatives and Education Initiatives for the city. And he has been working very, very hard at building relationships and bringing in new charter schools and um, supporting those charter schools that have a proven success rate in urban education. Um, we also had uh, the three to three um, uh, mayors um, early education council that we started um, and we released a report last, uh, I believe yesterday, about that. Well, we talked about um, what we did as a city to really impact early education. And, you know, that's, that's curbing that summer learning loss in our recreation centers and in our libraries, making sure that we are talking to parents. We give them a, a booklet and a pamphlet at birth so that they understand that we need you to be your child's first teacher. Um, we need you reading to them. We need you making sure that they're eating healthy and we need your help 
and, and ensuring that they have a fighting chance at life. Um, we paired up with the um, Healthy Babies Network as well as many community organizations to get books in the hands of our children. We just started the uh, story time with Styles, which um, you know um, our beauty salons and our barber shops are saying, okay, if we're going to have children here getting their hair done or getting their hair cut while they're sitting in our chair, let's have them read to us. And this is really about a community effort, all hands on deck. So no matter where you're going in our community, we want our children to know that we care about their education, we care about them, and we're still pushing this education initiative by involving everyone um, from the local barbershop and beauty salon to our libraries, our recreation centers where they used to just come and play in the summertime. It really has an academic component to it to ensure that they are receiving some, um, you know, reading uh, in, in curbing that summer learning loss. And um, one of our summer programs, our STEM program, um, actually received an award because everyone understands that, you know, um, we cannot lose our children um, in any in any way. And if they're going to be in our recreation centers and in our libraries, we want to make sure that they have the information and have people there that can help them academically as well. Let me ask you about East High School partnership with the University of Rochester. I know it's in full swing um, and we won't know until some time if in fact it works. But if we see that the partnership is successful, is it something that we know that it comes at a cost as well? Do you think you'd be open to increasing the funding allocation to the city school district in terms of replicating something like that model? Well, the city of Rochester is mandated to give 119.1 million right. uh, to the city um, school district um, but from the state of New York. And so we will always be mandated to give that money and we will continue to do that. That's 70% of the amount of money we collect for our taxes. Mm -hmm. um, and so we have only- but In terms of an increase, could, would you be interested in that? No, we cannot you necessarily can. increase, okay. but I believe that the state is looking at um, you know, increasing the dollars. Last year, they increased the number of dollars for the schools. Um, and they will continue to do that. When we look at our wheelhouse and what we're doing um, in our recreation centers, in our libraries, and making sure that we have a connection with the school district, right now we're looking at ways in which we can have a, um, a cross-department uh, um, you know, information sharing, where if a child is not in school, but they come to our recreation center that day, we know about it, or our library that day, we they know about it, and they can engage that child about, why didn't you go to school today? What's going on? How can we be helpful so that this is a community effort? And we are, um, our, our DRIES department is working with the school district, the libraries, as well as our local not-for-profit agencies around that. So a lot, a lot of work at hand, a lot of work that, you, that you've been doing so far in your tenure. And I, I want to know, among your constituents, are there any significant demographic or geographic groups uh, in Rochester that have been critical or less supportive of your work so far that you would say, you know what, I'd want to strengthen that relationship in 2016? Well, I think you always have, you know, critics on no matter what you do. Uh, the best thing that I believe that I can do as mayor is to focus on uh, providing the opportunity for our residents for jobs and economic development, you know, making sure that when we talk about education that we're putting forth the real steps that need to be put in place and working with the school district on, on you know, new ways to be innovative and thoughtful. Um, when we talk about safe neighborhoods and, and, and focusing on bringing resources to the neighborhood and uplifting the neighborhood, that we do that. You know, one of the things I often talked about during the campaign was I believe that we can do both. And I think that we've shown that we can do both. We can focus on downtown and our neighborhoods. We can focus on children and focus on families. We can focus on, you know, having a great police department that um, are connected to the neighborhoods and building those community relationships. And we will continue to do that. I want to ask one thing. According to the Center for Women in Politics, as of last January, of the 1,300 plus mayors of U.S. cities with populations over 30,000, 18.4 percent were women. And I watched an interesting documentary yesterday called Misrepresentation about how women are portrayed in the media. Um, they looked at how female politicians are portrayed, female uh, news reporters, and that sort of a thing. And and I want to know. They talked about critics um, and how some politicians, female politicians, may face critics because of the fact that they are female. And I want to know, do you think some of the criticism that you have received so far could, in fact, be connected to that? Well, yes, I think that change is hard. 
and change is difficult for anyone. And um, in the community that's going through um, through change, and I've seen the adversities that that we have, you know, experienced here in Rochester uh, when it comes down to a decline in, in employment opportunities and decline in education and people are looking and saying you know listen when is it going to be my turn when when are we going to really change what's happening in our in our neighborhoods I think that um, when when you're looking at all of that that you know people are going to be critical but I don't I don't take that to heart because it is truly my belief that as long as we're focused on the work as long as we are putting forth our best effort to ensure that those three priorities are met and that um, the community can see the change before their eyes and and, and I see it I, I, I hope that people in our community sees it as well when you think about where Rochester was um, a couple years ago and we are moving in a different direction. I want to stop you for right there <laughs> okay. because I have something I want I wanted to play. You maintained from day one that you said I will make sure that Rochester will be better than how I found it. And, and you released a video a couple weeks ago that's talking about what you were just about to say, not to cut you off. Um, you released this through your political action committee, echoing that very sentiment. So we'll play that so we can take a look. We have a lot of highly technical and highly skilled people, but we have a problem with those middle skills, wanting to work with our local colleges and um, at least our community colleges in filling that gap. Okay, so we're going to take a different video. So that was not that was not the one I wanted to show. This is of uh, from your political action committee, and you're talking a little bit about where Rochester was when you started and where it is now. As a Rochester resident, I'm telling you that the best days of our city are ahead. That we're not the city that we once were, but in the next couple years, you will see a city that has reinvented itself, that has changed for the better, that has lifted every one of our residents up by the bootstraps that want to be a part of this change. It's going to ensure that we have access to good quality jobs, that our children have access to good education, and that our neighborhoods are safe. We're gonna do everything in our power to make sure that that happens. So there's been a lot of speculation in local media about those TV spots. Do they at all connect to your aspirations uh, for political office in the future beyond the role of mayor? No, they do not. It is really about talking to my constituents. And the best way for me to talk to my constituents is to be in their, their homes. You know, in the summertime, we go door to door and we're talking to them. But to be able to say to uh, the citizens of Rochester, this is what we're doing and this is how we're doing. And this is the way that, you know, we envision the future of Rochester to be. Um, is what uh, those really are about. Um, I am so excited about the future of our city and the fact that, you know, when we talk about the Photonics Institute, the anti-poverty initiative, what we're doing and across the board, we're working hard. I asked you once if you would run for president and you laughed when I asked you that <laughs> question, but I want to know, would you be interested in a run for Congress? No. Not, not at, at all time. interested in a role for Congress at, not this, at time. this time. All right. Rochester Mayor Lovely Warren, it's great to have you back on the show. I hope that we can get you back on much sooner than last time. It's been mm -hmm. a long gap, but we look forward to talking with you in the future. Yeah. And you can learn more about the mayor's priorities, more jobs, safer streets, and better schools. Check out our website, mayorlovelywarren.com. Former president of South Africa, Nelson Mandela, once said that sport has the power to unite people in a way that little else does. Sport can awaken hope where there was previously only despair. A group of college students is working to put those words into action. Athletes at the University of Rochester are using sport as a platform to teach elementary and middle school aged girls in the city of Rochester about the game of soccer, leadership skills, the importance of higher education, and much more. Meet this week's Need to Know American Graduate Champion, Soccer Girls Rule. Okay, so today we're gonna work on shooting. Yay! Yay. Oh, I do that in gym. You do it in gym? No way. And we play those guys. That's exactly what awesome. we All right, so who knows how to shoot a ball? Me, me, me. These Rochester City kids are learning the fundamentals of the game of soccer and how to play the sport in all sorts of weather conditions, including rough winds. Free monthly clinics like this one are offered through Soccer Girls Rule. It's a league sponsored by Grassroot Rochester, 
a University of Rochester student organization led by U of R soccer players. And attending these clinics is about more than simply dribbling, passing, and hanging out with college kids. Okay, so this time, you guys did math last time, right? For the soccer girls rule, we want to focus mainly on education and the importance of it. Um, so what we do, one of my roles is I form the math and literacy components. Um, we have a whole curriculum, and each week the girls will receive different um, things to work on. The league also partners with a few Rochester City schools as part of its health education mission. U of R students teach youth about AIDS and HIV prevention in a city with the second highest HIV infection rate per capita in New York, outside of New York City. Parents and participants say the learning doesn't stop there. It's really fun because it helps me sometimes with my anger issues that I could just kick a ball instead of hurting people. We learn how to like dribble and communicate better. They teach us how to focus too, so that helps us a lot in school for me to focus if I'm getting really tired in class. It kind of made them more open to different things because they were just so closed in and sheltered to not doing stuff, so it made a lot of good friends. For this league, it's all about broadening horizons, building bridges, and empowering young women through a common passion, soccer. Soccer Girls Rule launched in 2012. You can learn more about the group and how to sign your kids up for free clinics at grsoccer.weebly.com. This segment was part of our ongoing Need to Know series called American Graduate Champions. We're highlighting individuals and organizations making an impact on a student, a classroom, the community, as we join forces to help area kids succeed on the journey from preschool to graduation. To learn more, go to wxxi.org grad. And before we close tonight, as you know, we've reported extensively on Monroe County's urban suburban program over the past few years on Need to Know. Well, this Sunday on WXXI television, you can check out a national report on urban suburban on PBS NewsHour Weekend. For the first time in years, the program is growing, but still only serves a small number of students. And while the experience of students involved in the program is often heralded as a success, Questions remain about whether the exchange has actually increased integration in the region's schools, which remain as segregated as ever. Be sure to tune in this Sunday at 6 p.m. on WXXI TV. And that's it for this edition of Need to Know. I'm Helen B. and Duty Hofer. Thank you for tuning in tonight and throughout the weekend on WXXI TV. And you can also check out the full show or specific stories we've covered online. Just go to WXXINews.org and click on the Need to Know link at the top of the page. We'd love to hear your thoughts and your comments. Have a good night.